Thank you to our brother and gospel recording artist, Phil French. God bless you, brother. Bless you. Amen. It's truly an honor to be able to stand here before you to proclaim God's word. Amen. Amen. So if you're willing and able, if you don't mind, would you stand with me and turn to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew, chapter 5. And I'll be reading verses 19 and 20. When you have it, say amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. And it says, So if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be great in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 20 says, But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Just so today for a few moments, I know we're doing the, also the uh, celebrating the life and legacy of Dr. King. I'd like to, uh, for us to focus on the subject, get it right. Amen. Get it right. Get it right. Amen. When you think about the words righteous or righteousness, one of the first thoughts that comes to mind is being or doing things correctly. Doing it the right way. You're morally right. Job was considered a righteous man in God's eyes. Enoch was a righteous man who walked with God. And Noah was also righteous in God's eyes. Amen. Righteous living enhances life, while foolish living enhances sinful desire. Mm -hmm. A righteous life says that I have been justified because I believe in Jesus Christ and that I am striving to live the right way. God says, because you place faith in my son Jesus Christ, even though you are a sinner, I am going to declare you righteous. Jesus Christ gave us right standing with God at the cross. Amen? Amen. That's how we produce righteous living through Jesus Christ. Here it is in Philippians, uh, chub, Philippians 1 verse 11. It says, may you always be filled with fruit of your salvation. The righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. When we work at living righteous, it tears down the destructive human self-will that is in us. So I'm telling you this morning and submitting, let's get it right. Foolish living says that I have a desire to live according to my will and my way without the aid of God as a result of living the wrong way. When we try to live by our own will, we are filled with unrighteousness. The American Heritage Dictionary, it says uh, the word righteous, which is the root word for righteousness, is defined as being morally upright or just. When you examine the word righteousness from the text in the original Greek, you find that it's defined as equity of character or act, specifically Christian. It's the state of being just, impartial and fair. Equity is a synonym for justice. And justice is defined as right decisions. One of the problems in our society today is that, generally speaking, some people are lacking when it comes to morals. But we've bought into the mindset and the idea that it's all about me. I can do what I want to do. You kind of like that, uh, the Heavy D song, if you're familiar with Heavy D, the song called We Got Our Own Thing. Uh, one of his verses says, Stay self-managed, self-kept, and self-taught. Be your own man. Don't be borrowed and don't be bought. But I don't know about you this morning, but I've been bought with a price. And I can't afford to live by my own means. You see, we can't afford to have the attitude of, 
You don't have the right to tell me what I'm supposed to be doing. And you do what you want to do. And I'll do what I want to do. But I don't know about you, but if you caught that. But the word I seem to be the focal point of each of the statements. That word I can get you in trouble. When I went to Marine Corps boot camp, the first thing they did was remove the word I from our vocabulary. Because it was not about me or us. It was about a team. You could not say I. If you said I in boot camp, you were punished. Someone once said, righteous life truly pays off. The Lord coaches a righteous person to navigate well in life and guides them in good paths. It is, at hard, it is hard at times to consistently live a righteous life. But at the end of the day, it is worth it to do right and live right. Amen? So church, let's get it right. Looking at the text, we find that Jesus is trying to get us to take a very good, close, and hard look at ourselves. To see if we are conducting ourselves in a manner that is pleasing and acceptable to God. But now let's understand something here. Our righteousness, according to Isaiah 64 and 6 says, we are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, there is nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. Our righteousness, it makes a turn for the better when we accept Christ as Lord and Savior, as we strive daily to do better and live better. Amen? Amen. This then gives us a moral compass, which gives us direction on how to live a righteous life. So what am I trying to say here? If you don't know Jesus, then it's time to get it right. If you don't know Jesus but want to do your own thing and not operate in obedience to his will and his word, or you may have some setbacks that have knocked you off course, then it's time to get it right. In the text, Jesus starts off in verse 19 talking about breaking the least of these commandments. What was he referring to here? So back in the, you know, Jesus, God gave us 10 commandments in Exodus chapter 20. Uh, which were his requirements for living a righteous and holy life. Amen? Amen. The rabbis and religious leaders, they took those 10 and they turned them in somewhere over 600, which made it extremely difficult to keep and abide by. One of the things they also did was assert that some of the commandments carried more weight than others. But that's not how God sees it. Here's the point. With God, sin is sin is sin is a sin. And no sin carries more weight than the other. For example, a lie carries the same weight as a murder in the sight of God. Because with him, sin is a sin. The problem is that people were justifying their actions, calling them acceptable, and teaching others that it's all right to do those things. You see, in today's society, we have the tendency of saying, well, I can't do everything that needs to be done, but God knows my heart. But the reality of it all is that he really does know our hearts and knows that we can do better. When we're doing the bare minimum or don't even want to do better at all. But God is not looking for excuses. He's looking for obedience. So take his word and live it out. Amen. Yes, amen. We should not ignore our responsibility to teach others how to live righteously because the scripture tells us in Luke chapter 12, it's in verse 48 B, from everyone who has been given much much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Amen? We have the responsibility to share with others what we have learned regarding eternal life. This gospel we have will do us no good if we keep it to ourselves. We spread the good news about a good movie, a good game, a good meal, good insurance, good advice, good jobs, good friends, and a good doctor, right? Why not spread the good news about a savior who is a healer, a protector, a provider, a way maker, and a real friend? Yes. Everything about God is good, amen? Yes. And yes, God is real. Because it's a giveaway gospel. And the more we do so, the more the Lord will replenish it in our lives, amen? The Lord further goes on to deal with the kingdom of heaven. This is the kingdom that will be established when he returns as kings of kings and lord of lords. Christ will come and set up his eternal, literal, earthly kingdom that will last forever. 
But my question before you today is, do you want to be counted as least or great in the kingdom of heaven? So let's take a few moments and talk about three things about getting it right. Amen. The first thing I want us to understand is don't be a Pharisee. Don't be a Pharisee. The word Pharisee means the separated ones. The Pharisees went against Jesus because he did not accept because he did not accept their interpretation of the oral law. The Pharisees were so focused on keeping the letter of the law that they missed the spirit of the law. Their keeping of the law actually put people in bondage rather than setting them free. They were fake, phony and hypocritical. What they wanted more than anything else is to be seen by everybody doing acts of righteousness. But uh, but but it was only for their individual benefit and not the kingdom's glory. There was a commentary that said the religionists, the Pharisees and the scribes had some righteousness. They just didn't have enough. They were, in fact, strict religionists. They worked at obeying thousands and thousands of rules and regulations, governing everything ranging from dress and social behavior to ministry and work. However, they lacked the one essential, loving God so much that they would deny themselves and seek their righteousness in his son, Jesus Christ. End of that quote. So guess what? They looked the part. They talked the part. They gave the impression they were living the part. But they missed the mark by focusing on themselves and not on God. It's, it's like that person who asked the lady, how far along are you? And she wasn't even pregnant. What he thought he saw was not what it was because there was nothing on the inside. We come to church looking the part, looking like we're spiritually pregnant when there is really nothing on the inside. A Christian is not known by how well they shout, how much we know, or being or, or seen being uh, seen carrying a Bible under our arms. Even in our society today, there are some who feel that going to worship Sunday after sur Sunday is being obedient to God. But here's the problem: we can go to worship or do things religiously, but when we arrive, are we really fulfilling the spirit of the law? We are made to give God glory because that's why he made us. Here it is in Isaiah 43 and 7. He said, bring all who claim me as their God, for I have made them for my glory. It was I who created them. You see, we're taught that God is looking for true worshipers. Amen. In John 4 and 24, he said, for God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We can't be religious like the Pharisees were. And therefore, when we break the threshold of the house of the Lord, our minds should be made up to give God the glory that is due to his name. Amen. Because God really does know our hearts. Amen. So let's get it right. Secondly, I want us to ask you this question is, how are you living? How are you living? Are you disconnected from the old self? Have you set yourself apart from the world, not living like the world, not thinking like the world, not sinning like the world? How do you act around others, your co-workers, your family, other Christians? There's a lot to think about, and it can be tough to act out at times, too. But nobody's perfect, and we're all a work in progress. Amen. I want us to understand that this is not just about what people see of us. But more important, what God sees when nobody else is watching. You see, it is easy to live righteous in front of people. Go about doing good, helping people, being seen, uh, doing acts of kindness, saying the right things at the right time. But what about your motives? Are you emulating the Pharisees? God never intended that we give the impression of being good or righteous, but expected us to live it out daily. One of the commentaries that said, some feel they must do good to be acceptable to God. Their motive in life is to work and work at doing good in order to secure God's acceptance. They have never learned the truth. They cannot do enough good to be perfectly acceptable to God. They must trust his love, that he loved them so much that he will take their trust 
and count it as righteousness. Amen. When we think about this quote, we must come to understand that we cannot work for our salvation because the Bible teaches us in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, God saved you by grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. Amen? Amen. The fact that you live a better life, do better things, and are a nicer person may make you a better neighbor, but it doesn't make you fit for heaven. That can only happen by grace. Suppose three men, they wanted to swim to Hawaii. Well, one of the uh, might swim further than the other, but eventually they're not going to make it because Hawaii is too far. So what I'm trying to say is that God is too high. He's too holy for even uh, us on our best days, our weeks or years to make ourselves acceptable to him. Our salvation is based on God's grace. Amen. And finally, my third thing is another question is, do you know him? Do you know him? Do you really know him? There was a time when I was just coming to church. I had that, the look of spiritually being pregnant, but there was nothing on the inside. I was empty. I was hurting. And I didn't want anyone to know that my relationship with God was not on point. But here's the thing. God let me wallow in my pity until I cried out to him. So what is your relationship like with the Lord? For example, I know my wife and she knows me. If we had not met and developed a relationship, our lives would have taken a different direction in life. When did you come to know the Lord? Was it as a child living in a Christian home? Later in life? Or maybe in a midlife crisis and you called on the Lord and he heard your cry? Sometimes we have to remind ourselves self of these things to keep the fire burning on the inside. When you are a Christian, you should make it a point to know Jesus Christ personally. Not only should you just know him, you should know about him. You need to understand that the coming of Christ was necessary. You need to understand that there was a need for our atonement. We needed covering and God saw something that needed justice and condemnation. Understand that God sent his son to us in human flesh. Understand the knowledge of his teachings, his love for the least, the last, and the left out. Understand he has given you the power to overcome your human error. Today, let's take a person, personal responsibility to do our best to get it right. Amen? Amen? My granddaddy would always say to the family, no matter what was going on, he would always say, do the best you can. Whether we was arguing, happy, or fighting, he always ended with do the best you can. I want us all, including me, to do the best we can. Amen? Amen? Well, let's see what the Bible has to say about that. First, we've got to know God's word. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, we find all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize that it is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Amen. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. Next, we've got to know how to worship God. In Psalms 9, 1 and 2, we find, I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell you all the marvelous things you have done. I will be fulfilled with joy because of you. I will sing praises to your name, O Most High. And thirdly, we've got to love God. In Deuteronomy 6 and 5, it said, we find that, uh, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Amen? Amen. And then D, we've got to trust God. In Proverbs 3 and 5, one of the favorite scriptures of many is, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. Amen? Amen. And then we've got to love one another. That was one of the things Dr. King, he wanted us all to love one another in spite of what we look like. He wanted us all to love one another. John 13 and 34, Jesus said, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Amen. Amen. So if we want to get it right, we've got to get it right with Jesus. He's the end all as it pertains to righteousness. 
Romans 10 and 4 tells us, for Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, all who believed in him are made right with God. Amen. Paul makes the statement because Christ is the one from whom we can receive our righteousness. Let me tell you what righteousness did for us. The righteous one, Jesus Christ, paid the penalty for us at the cross. Amen. Giving the opportunity to get it right. I'm here to tell you this morning that when you get it right, your sins are covered. You are delivered from where you used to be. Your debt has been paid. You have the capacity to stand in God's presence without guilt, without shame, without blame, and without fault. When you get it right, our life is purposeful. When you get it right, we are putting God on display, demonstrating his goodness, amen, and demonstrating his mercy. When we get it right, we get abounding grace, we receive mercy, we get eternal love, we get unlimited blessings, we are granted forgiveness, and we are set free, amen? amen. We are no longer condemned, we are redeemed, we are justified. So this morning I submit to you that when you accept Christ, you have to understand that he sees you as righteous, amen? So let's get it right, amen? Because the Lord blesses the righteous and his eyes are upon the righteous and his ears are open to their cry, amen? The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears the effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man, which availeth much. Amen. When you seek the first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, everything else will be added to you. That comes from Matthew 6 and 33. And then it also says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Because we have in store for us a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give us on that day. So now, church, let's get right and let's go home. Amen. Amen. Because God is truly worthy to be praised. Amen. God bless you this morning. Amen. Amen. If you don't mind standing to your feet this morning. Get it right. Perhaps someone is here this morning. Maybe you've been struggling straining in and out and you're trying to get it right but you keep falling short I'm here to tell you that we have a savior a savior who loves you and now is the acceptable time he loves you in spite of everything you have done he is a forgiver and he loves us all if you do not know Jesus in the pardon of your sins, this is the invitation. And we extend it to you. Anyone that may come now, if you don't know Jesus. Or maybe you're looking for a church home. Now is the acceptable time. Maybe you're looking for prayer. We have prayer warriors that will pray for you. Will there be one this morning? Amen. You may be seated. We are family.